Okay. Well, um, if you didn't know, me and Smitty are be going are going to do the first panel for Thread Raiders, I guess. We just thought we'd uh, talk a bit about how uh, we do rewards in RPGs. I was going to be doing the talking, and then Smitty was going to be the, uh, what's it called when you take the opposite position? Um, like devil's advocate, counterpoint, yeah. counterpoint guy. Yeah. I was thinking yeah. of myself more as like a color commentator. Like you'd be doing the okay. play, play and, yeah. you know, kind of dry. The peanut you know, gallery. Straight man. And then I'd be like the like wacky comic relief. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have any thoughts that you want to get out before we get going? Or should we plug Jasper's Game Week next week that's going on right now? Or I mean, you just basically said all the things I was going to say. Okay. So I would suggest that you say all those things again. Jasper's Game Week is going from May something may 3rd to may 7th my producer says may 7th i'm i'm getting um, a note i'm getting a note yes yes yeah that's yeah mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um so yeah i guess uh since it is eight o'clock now on on my windows computer uh well wonderful i'm ready now yeah I'm glad we got all the jitters out yeah okay so um welcome to the panel now, tell me if this sounds familiar. You finish fighting a battle with some bandits, and you eagerly say, I searched their pockets for some treasure. DM informs you that, alas, they didn't have much gold on them, but I guess you find some silver and their rusty weapons? Well, surely you get some experience from that, right? Again, alas, you're informed that the campaign is using, using milestone experience. So how exactly were, were you rewarded for that? What was the point of that? Slide two. Hi, I'm Brett. I DM for Geek Attack on Tuesdays at 9.30 on this channel, and you could follow us at Geek Attack, and you could follow me at Tango2. And I'm a huge fan of goblinoids, vampires, and dragons. Joining me uh, you could, is Smitty, and you could follow him at PB Smitty, and he's a huge fan of pumpernickel bread. It's true. Documented proof of that. Indeed. Uh, in this talk tonight, I'll be talking about rewards and RPGs. I guess we'll be talking about rewards and RPGs. I kind of feel like you're going to be talking about the, the rewards and RPGs, and I'll just be making facial expressions. Yeah, the, the color commentary. Mm-hmm. While I'll generally be focusing on 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons, some things can be generalized to other editions and even other games. So let me go over what I'll be covering tonight. Slide three. Consumables. Everyone goes and buys healing potions, uh, but even in Dungeon Master's Guide, there's a bunch of potions that I never see get used. Is that because people don't like consumables? Should they be changed? Uh, And then after that, I'll be talking about campaign level points and currency. While this does not work as well for sandbox campaigns, having an overarching point tally or currency you can gain can make it so that even if your players are keeping the town safe from like wolves, they're gaining something, hopefully. Uh, After that, uh, crafting. I have seen ex- uh, exactly one item crafted in Dungeons and & Dragons, and it didn't follow the rules. So I'm going to be talking a bit about how you could change crafting a bit to help reward your players. Uh, and then lastly, magic item design. When we think of rewards, the big one is magic items. The loot, the swag. I'll go over a bit about how I design magic items, and we'll discuss that a bit. Um, I chose these subjects because I feel like they've are generally disregarded or underused. And hopefully us talking about it can bring some solutions to that. Slide four. People generally don't like to use consumables. Not just players, I mean, but I feel like DMs don't use them either. Players tend to fall into the trap of, I might need it now, but I might need it more later. I'm sure everyone has experienced this at least once, uh, especially in a game like Final Fantasy, where you stockpile these rare elixirs which fully restore health and mana, and then you walk into the final boss with like 40 of them, and then you end up not using any. The exceptions to this are healing potions. Regardless of what sort of RPG you're playing, you're generally going to be, there's generally going to be a thing that you can consume to restore your health. One of the problems with that is that if you're low on health in 5e, you need to use an action to chug a potion, and then whatever you're fighting swipes you again, and then you're back at square one. Only you lack a healing potion. In Diablo 2, uh, um, Diablo 2 had a um, 
had potions that were consumable. You jammed them into your potion belt and then mashed the heal button whenever you're getting pummeled. Or you were a sorcerer like me and you guzzled all the mana potions so you didn't have to wait for your mana to uh, when you were teleporting across the map. This necessitated that every mini boss uh, enemy dropping several potions and any after any sort of hard battle, you might need to return to town to buy more potions. That approach worked in the early 2000s, but I think we moved beyond then. In Diablo 3, the potion changed from a consumable into a cooldown. It was another resource you had to manage to be successful. But it wasn't a big deal if you drank it at an inopportune moment. It'd come back relatively shortly. However, it prevented you from just mashing it whenever. A thing Diablo 3 added later on is potion augments. Your healing potions got extra effects when you drank them. Examples include less damage taken for a short period of time, healing when you struck an enemy, enemy like leech life, and even a short-term fear. Area of effect fear, of course. Now, why am I talking about all this? Because I think tabletop RPGs can learn something from this. Maybe your potion of storm drawing strength refills after a particular feat of strength, or maybe it just recharges daily. This way, players won't be so stingy on using them. Maybe your healing potions instead has an added effect of frightening enemies around you. This way, you get to heal, and you should have some breathing room so you don't get hit again. So, question. Should consumables change? Slide 5. Big shout out to our producer who's been managing the slides in the back end. In my opinion, I think that consumables, I think, either need to be changed or they need to be brought into the forefront so that they're generally used more. I, I bring this up later in uh, my panel, but in Xanathar's Guide to Everything, they assume that you get something like 75 consumables over the course of like 20 levels. I feel like that's a lot, and I don't really see it that much. Smitty, what do you think? Well, Brett, thank you for asking. Not only do I have a hot take, I have several. And I'm Great. going to use them because I like to consume. So mm. here's what I'm thinking. First of all, I agree that they need to change. Uh, they're not getting used. Um, generally, um, folks you know, are hoarding them uh, for use later because they fear that <clears throat> they're gonna need them at an opportune moment, like you said. Um, and really, you know, the healing potions, I think, is the one thing that you can say, you know, cause and effect, right? Like I'm, I'm down on health, so I'll use a healing potion. It's a very, <laughs> you know, deliberately applied um, potion. So it makes sense that people are using it more. <clears throat> So I agree they have to change, but I actually favor going a little bit the other way. Um, I think if you turn potions into things that sort of reset or renew uh, the next day, and then what you're really just doing is creating a, a magic item. Um, and I think there's a, something nice about potions in that they specifically are um, you know, one-time usage type thing. It's, it's also for the same reason that some of the magic items that are like, this only has six charges and then it's done. It's like, why not make it a potion? Um, but one of the things uh, you know, that I sort of like to do, and I've got a few here, but um, I'll throw this one out to start because it's sort okay. of um, somewhat unique. I haven't seen a lot of people do it. Um, make the magic item uh, basically like a limited time offer. Um, it's a potion. Maybe it's brewed and it spoils. Uh, maybe, you know, it's only got like a, a two week lifespan, that kind of thing. Uh, so shelf, you know, life, your, you shelf life, if you will. Um, and, you know, force the, the players to say, oh, oh you know, this, this is going to go bad tomorrow. Uh, I better use it today. And maybe they can use it the next day, uh, even if it goes bad. Um, but maybe there'll be consequences. But I think kind of putting that time bound, um, you know, flavor to it uh, really does kind of force folks to use it and make it a little bit kind of exciting when they do. Right. I, th I think that's a good idea. But uh, uh, again, I, th I feel like that if you're doing that, it kind of gets again towards the... I need it now but i ne might need it more later and then you end up not using it and just letting it spoil but maybe that's like it's fine for that because having it in your pocket as like a safety net sort of thing so you can use it provides a benefit of like you can you have it but you don't need it like uh you, you can use the healing potion if you want but like you, you don't need to use it. It's like I got this in my back pocket just in case, kind of thing. So you might right. be taking a little, a little more risks, even though you actually do don't use it. Yeah, I think you you have to add a declining value to it because what potions there people are like kind of risk averse in that regard, right? Like they they think like if they use it now, 
and they'll get like a good benefit, but they want to get a better benefit later. And in their heads, they're thinking like, it's definitely going to have a better, better benefit later. Um, and you can't really do much to combat that, right? Like you either have to be like super specific that it's a very high benefit now to prompt them to use it, um, or, you know, you can't give them the option to use it later. Uh, and it, it really has to be one of those two things in my mind. Um, or they get some sort of maybe ancillary benefit from, from using it now. So one of the other things that I like to do, um, honestly, is like if a kind of like, you know, if you have like a, that relative uh, that maybe gives you a gift and you always feel like, okay, you know, I have to like put it out when they come over or they're always going to like ask me about it. Like, oh, are you enjoying that like crock pot I got you or whatever? I don't know. Um, but the the folks that give them the the items, the potions, maybe have, you know, some of them can be like recurring NPCs that are like, oh, did you use that potion of, of giant strength I gave you? How did it work out? And then like when you didn't use it, they feel bad. Uh, and you sort of like make them be like, oh, you, you know, um, I did use it. Um, it was great. And the next time they're in battle, you know, one of the guys will turn to him like, you should use that. Like, you know, old lady Harry, it's going to be really upset if you don't. That's actually kind of funny, like guilting your players into not using their consumables. I think that's a, that's a good idea. Yeah. I'm all um, about the guilting of the players. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, do you want to keep things moving? Do you have any other thoughts about consumables? Um, um, yeah, let me, I feel like I'm me, just agreeing with you at this point. <laughs> let, me, let me throw in uh, a couple more things on consumables because I think there's two yeah, reasons sure. people don't use consumables, right? Like they are... Well, again, we talked about it. They're, they're worried they're going to have better use for it in the future, right? Like, so that's that's number yeah. one. We've talked about a few ways to, to do it. Honestly, I think the other big thing why people don't use consumables is they forget about them. You get like maybe you know Xanthar says seventy five. I feel like some players have like twenty or thirty banked in their you know whatever bag or um, and yeah. then like they're like, how am I going to pull this out? I know I know we'll get to that in a little bit, but I'm thinking of like just even from a logistical gameplay perspective, um, anytime you can do physical representations obviously that works better for in in person stuff but like you know you have the the potion of healing that's an actual potion you know we've all seen people do that but like do that for other stuff too um you know i like to give my my players like actual potions like you know maybe like a kool-aid drink or something when you're at the table and then they can like you know take it later um but the other thing is that man your inventory sheets in like either on paper or in dnd beyond are just super duper cluttered because you put in things that who the heck cares about like your pitons go in there, right? And your like rations and your bedroll from your explorer's pack or whatever all show up in there. And then you got to scroll down to see all these things. I like to take the approach where like, it's a common, it's a very common thing. Just assume the players have it. Get that off of the inventory sheet and have your inventory sheet really just be a list of those like magical or, you know, pertinent special items so that they're always there. They're always top of mind and players can, you know, see them constantly reminded. They start forming plans with them. You never want a player to be in a situation where it's like, I don't know how to get out of this. Let me like scroll through 15 spells and all my potions and delay the game by like 35 minutes because I'm, you know, flipping pages and stuff. Much better would be like if they're in the middle of combat, their turn's coming up, they look down and they see that potion at the top of their list. And they'd be like, aha, I've got an idea. Their turn comes, boom, super cool moment. Yeah, I I agree. <laughs> um, I I hot takes. Yeah, I I don't think that's that hot because I I, I agree. Cold cold takes. Um, cold cold takes. Absolutely ice cold. No, I I mean I think that's a, a good point. Um, the inventory management, especially in D and D Beyond, uh, I feel like they the the tabs that they have there, it's like. You kind of have like the attacks and the spells if you have them, and then you get the equipment. And, and like, if you need to put in something that isn't like an actual item in D and D, you need to do the thing. Where you have like the other tab where you just write down like I got a rabbit's foot or something, and it's like yeah, you, you're never gonna look at that. They put the core even like roll twenty does the same thing, right? Like you you quote in your macros, and you're gonna have your like five macros at the top that are like you know Eldritch Blast or you know Warhammer Swing, whatever. Like you don't get very creative. You get funneled into these like you know eighty percent of the time. Um, I'm using twenty percent of what I have, and you got to break free of that uh, with some of these other things we talked about. But yeah, um, I know you've got more slides, and I've got more takes. So why don't we get back into it? For sure. Slide six. In the campaign I run on Tuesdays for Geek Attack, the party is trying to stop a horde of goblinoids from evading, invading and torching the Elslier Vale. 
without revealing too much, they've been accumulating these victory points that will help them in the inevitable culmination when they make their stand against the Goblinoid's forces in the walled fortress city of Brindle. The use for these is twofold. One, there'll be less reinforcements during the final battle where they, they'll have to defend the city, and two, the general outcome of the battle, whether it's a rout or a pure victory. Now, defeating major captains and commanders, uh, disrupting supply lines and alliances, and buying time all contributes to these victory points. Well, you can always say something like, this just advances the plot. This codifies it in, more, in a more concrete way. Advancing the plot is sort of the same thing as milestone experience. Although the players know they are advancing, it's probably better to have a, a, a proper gauge of how much they're advancing. Uh, additionally, another resource in this campaign is time. At nearly the beginning of the campaign, we they found out from a map that there were a horde of goblins advancing in Brindle, with dates on when uh, they'd make it to each location along the Dawn Way. This sort of set the tone for the campaign, where dilling dailing had a price. This would make it so that they have to weigh different options of uh, what to do versus how much time it would take, at, at least in theory. There was this guy, I think his name was uh, like Gary Gygax or something. He said, and I quote, you cannot have a meaningful campaign if strict time records are not kept, end quote. That quote is actually in all caps, by the way. I thought that was interesting. There, was, there were also a couple ways they could slow down this army, which would buy them time to, have, uh, to do other things. Um, in the other campaign I initially pitched to my current group, it was going to center around gathering resources and building alliances to build up a town and an army to take back a world that has been under the thumb of the oppressive drow. So one of the things I imagined was the importance of securing resources. Maybe they have to take back a logging camp or a mine from the drow or their allies. They would use these gathered resources to either build up their town or headquarters, or maybe they would trade it to nearby towns for resources they can't normally acquire or just to build up an alliance. This would feed back into itself because with a more effective town, they could spread their influence, which would get them more resources, resources which they could build up their town, et cetera, et cetera. So while they wouldn't necessarily be getting tons of money from these resources, it would advance their cause. Now, there, there's probably other ways you could do this. Forest spirits stole the protective light from the town and you need to get it back. The light only lasts so long, so you need to go back into the forest to get more. You need to wake up the seven sages from the seven dungeons to stop the evil king that took over the land. Wake him up. Waking up these sages causes that area to be safer, but the other areas are more dangerous, dangerous as the evil king reinforces them. Collect 120 power stars to restore the princess's castle. Use the stars to open the doors to get more stars in the castle. You, you get the idea. Uh, Spinny, what do you feel... Uh, how how is your hot takes on uh, campaign level resources that aren't just gold magic items experience? Yeah, I like so. First of all, quick plug, but really it's not a plug because uh, it's very genuine. Um, I'm really enjoying our Tuesday night games. Um, it's the first time I play with Brett. Brett's a fantastic DM. Put so much effort into moving the game along, and one of the things I really love about it um, is sort of the time bound nature of it. Um, and you know, it really does feel. Uh, it gives it gives more of a um, sort of tense uh, background element to it um, that I that I really appreciate it. It adds emotion to the game that I think otherwise would be lost if it was just open ended. Um, so I really enjoy that that time bound nature of it. Um, I always use milestone leveling in my games. I just functionally I dislike XP. I feel it becomes makes the game very transactional. It's like you know when I used to be playing like Dragon Warrior when I was in like elementary school like hitting the slimes just to get XP like all day long. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I do like the, the campaign sort of like resources. I, I don't know that I like them so much as like being explicitly defined. Um, I know you talked um, one of the other days after the game, we were talking about sort of the like campaign points, like victory, victory points. points. Yeah. yeah. And I, I don't like it because again, that, that takes a, in my mind, something I like is like relationship building inside of the game through RP and turns it into sort of a more transactional, like I've got to, you know, I've got to sway the, the, the noble or I don't get my like 15 extra points. Um, but I do like it from the context of, um, you know, just like in life, like, you know, you build friendships, you build connections and stuff. And, you know, obviously 
you're not in it just for like what they're going to do for you, but they have benefits. You know, maybe the the good friend of yours that you've had for a couple of years has a job opening or, you know, someone, you know, uh, has a cousin that, you know, is selling a car, like whatever it may be. And in, in the campaign, I like that element, right? Like, yeah, you free the town. Um, so later on, you know, maybe they're more willing to give you refuge when you're, you're fleeing something. Right. Yeah. Um, and you, you can connect that to, um, the larger game in my, in my home game, you know, there's the typical, like huge battle coming and everyone knows that it's coming and the players are kind of not only outgunned by the massive, like BBEG that they'll be facing, but all of his arrayed forces are becoming more and more clear to them. Um, so they've started, uh, like, you know, accumulating those, those resources for victory. Um, and in this case, what they've done is they found like a nascent, uh, gun manufacturing, like, uh, uh, gunpowder, uh, mine. And these people are like, we don't really know what it does, but we're excited. So they've like invest a lot of resources into trying like to build up, Infant, uh, you know, like gunpowder and guns. Yeah. And yeah. it's going to be awesome when those guys, like, you know, like a hundred of them face off with all these baddies and they just start like, you know, laying waste to all of them. Um, and so they've started to think that way. And I, I really appreciate that. So long story short, um, I agree with it. Uh, I think it's, it can be done well. Um, the one, the areas that you spoke about, I think play really well when they are sort of relationship based, less transactional. Um, I don't yeah. like the sort of like, let me just accumulate, you know, not, not coins, not treasure, but just something else I'm putting a, a quantity on. Yeah. The, the, Victory points were, I think, supposed to be uh, a check and balance against um, just like uh, mainlining the campaign in such a way where you're kind of like, well, there's all that stuff happening, but I feel like the more pressing issue is that whole goblin thing. So we're just going to go straight to Brindle, wait 30 days and like build up that whole thing and then have that final battle. I mean, I, I get it, but I also think that like you've done a really good job. Like we know that's not an option, right? Like we know that if we did that, we'd get our butts handed to us because it's just it's very obvious that that is not a winning strategy. It's not TNT. It's not. I mean, it could be. Uh, it, uh, but, yeah, you know, sure. You, if you had laid out like you know the goal of this is to save the town, we probably would have dug in. But you didn't. You didn't drive us to that. Um, we were the ones who were like push everyone to Brindle. Like we know it was the the end of it, but you were like they're coming to kill the Vale. Um, so we were like, let's put them in a wall house. So basically we don't have to think about them and then we can run rampant yeah. and do whatever we want yeah. around the countryside. Um, but you didn't force that on us, which I think is important. And you also made it very clear that victory in, in that campaign relies on more than just very specific, uh, you know, like a main quest, right? That yeah. all the side quests do add to the main kind of quest. Feed um, into it. Right. But it's, it's not uh it's not like discreet it's not defined it is very amorphous like we don't know what we're doing with the blood lord like we don't know if it's going to work to our benefit or not but like we're trying we're trying something because we know it's it's got to be done we just don't know what the outcome's going to be and i think that's kind of awesome yeah I, I try to make it so that all the side quests aren't just like you know we we do the thing and that's a check mark of of victory points i, I try to make it so that it, it kind of fed into your backstories a bit so that you're not just like oh i guess we have to do the thing to get the freaking points it's like well you know alizin has to go find out what this thing is with the blood lord because there's there's things that are happening with it and i want to find out so it's kind of like not really railroading her into like going this way but more like this is like a little like fishing net exercise where there's a bait and then, uh, kind of right like and you and I think, you know, here's probably maybe something where we do disagree, right? Like what you see as the outcome if she didn't follow those paths, right? Like if her as a player character was like, my backstory is like too painful for me. I don't want to, I don't want to go down that road or like I'm rejecting who I was. Would you say, would you say like, okay, like that's going to cost you or is it yeah. just, a, yeah. Well, it, yes, but like, it's kind of like the, uh, you've a yes, but situation where it, it costs you like you didn't have to do it, but it'll cost you kind of like um, I, I feel like in the it, basically the the most prudent uh, like results of not doing that would be there'd be undead reinforcements in the final battle, um, which would make it harder. And additionally, since I know both you and Jordan uh, like to be involved with the story and very much be like tied to these characters. I, I knew I, 
that wasn't really a problem. So I didn't really think of what would happen if you didn't do that because right. it kind of isn't a problem. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's fair. I, I do think there has to be consequences to not of course. digging into what you put out, right? Like otherwise, what's the point? Like there's, it's just, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. Um, so, well, I kind of like sort of outlined like there will be undead reinforcements, dot, 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 question mark. <laughs> sure. And then I, I was kind of going to like get like at, see what happens when the whenever it arose. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, that makes sense. I think, you know, it doesn't always have to be A or B. You know, I, I think you know that. Sure. You know, it's it's re reductive because we're on a, you know, we're talking in a limited amount of time. Um, you know, I think that there's, you know, there's a lot of ways to to get the job done. So it's like, and, and even actually some of them, uh, maybe you can't do, uh, which I think you're bringing up with the, with the amount of time that we have, right? Like maybe there's like 10 things that we can do. If we get like eight of them done, it'll probably be an easy victory, but not all eight of them are mutually, um, you know, possible and achievable. Yeah. So we have to choose which ones we do. And I yeah. like that. Um, but I think, you know, players have this, and it's really from, you know, kind of video games. They're obviously they're a lot different now um, where you kind of have the, um, you know, your, your gameplay, the choices you make carry over from game to game and things like that in a lot of different franchises now. But like originally you'd go for like world completion, right? And like you'd want to yeah. do every possible thing that you could. And so many people didn't want to miss anything. It's like the people that used to hold the choose your own adventure books and have like five fingers in them. So you could go back and see, you know, what all the possible routes you'd have. And I think there's something really fun to not being able to do that with the costs of making that choice and then having another road forever closed off to you. I think it's really important to maintain. Um, and, you know, it feels narrative, it feels cinematic, but really it's a campaign resource. Like you've yeah. only got so many branches of a tree to go down. Um, so you better, you know, choose wisely. I I kind of, uh, yeah, because especially with video games now, you have the achievements and everyone wants to get all the achievements because that's what you're supposed to do. You've got to get them all. And so when you have like the, the one thing that you, you miss and you can't go back to it, you have that one achievement that's like just locked off forever and you're just like, it, it burns your soul, you know? So it, if it was just uh, about doing all the things, it, it becomes like check marks. I need to do all the things because that's what the achievement list says. I, right. It says I need to do them all, so I need to do it. And I mean, that, that also puts the world in a more static place, right? Like yeah. No, oh, we have to defeat this lion. I'm sure the lion will still be there three years from now when I decide I want to attack, which I hate, right? Like, yeah, you know, everything else should be. This costs me. This makes me. Um, this puts me in trouble in my games. Is that I constantly keep like the background of the world moving. So like that bad guy that you aren't facing it because you're building up your resources. Well, guess what? He's building up his resources too. Um, exactly. They've got more armies. They've got more items. Um, and you come back and they've leveled up. Um, but you know, players, I think, have a hard time. They they make their plans from a static perspective. And I think the more that you can get them thinking dynamically, um, the more of a rewarding experience it'll be. Exactly. Great. Another place where we agree, okay. Brett. Yeah, we, we got there. Some, some divisive questions on the next one so we can start yelling yeah. at each other. Well, I guess uh, if we go to slide seven, um, I have some thoughts about crafting, and this is where the hot takes start, I think. So, uh, Maybe just don't do crafting. <laughs> I think everyone has tried to skin or scale or pluck or harvested something from some sort of dead beast. I don't know if uh, people do this because they just like having animal parts or they hope it can be fashioned into a nice alligator leather tunic. It would be nice for these encounters with magical beasts uh, that they could have some sort of physical rewards that aren't shoehorned in. Like, I guess you find a wand of magic missiles in between some of the bones in the griffin's nest. I personally don't think it works though. The crafting system in general would need to be radically changed to make it use uh, to make use of it in most campaigns. In Xanathar's Guide to Everything, it says it would take a week to make a nice alligator outfit, assuming, of course, you're making a leather or studded leather armor. This problem is exacerbated if you're trying to make a magical alligator outfit. A studded alligator leather armor of fire resistance would take 10 weeks in-game to complete. A plus three studded alligator leather armor would take 50 work weeks in game to complete. And I just think that's that's way too long. Um, personally, instead of using crafting, I would much rather have players find either damaged items or magical raw material that could be used as some sort of seed for a quest. Uh, your, your players find a sword of a with a magnific magnificent ruby hilt and it's broken. Maybe a friendly dwarf crafter in the nearby town will know how to fix it. 
And while he's fixing it, the dwarf mentions he could trade out the ruby for an equivalent gem if he wanted a different effect on the final product. Maybe you want your sword to do ice damage instead of fire damage. Maybe your character wants to have a blade a little shorter or lighter for a short sword instead of a long sword. The time it takes for your friendly dwarf to fix this shouldn't be very long. Your player's finding the damage components along with the magical raw material is supposed to be the hard part. It doesn't have to be harder by having to remember to come up and pick it up, or worse, waiting for it. Spinny, I think you know exactly what I'm talking about when I say magical raw materials that you find maybe in a swamp. Um, what are your thoughts on this? I gave that away because I thought it was better used by uh, the person who ultimately took it. You know, for a little bit of backstory on exactly what's going on there, folks, I'll have to tune in Tuesday nights to see Geek Attack and see who is wearing that starry cloak. But anyway, um, I... F- I don't, I don't, I don't mean to like poo poo on this part. I don't care about crafting. I, I, I think it's do dumb. I. I hate it. I know. Um, I used to get so angry. I used to play Guild Wars 2 like a lot um, when it first came out. And the whole crafting economy drove me nuts. And it would be like, why do I have to go and find like basil? And it, like, I don't care. I, like, I don't even like doing that in life, like looking through herbs. Go to the, the grocery store. Yeah. Like, yeah. No. I don't, I don't play D&D for that. Um, I know some people do, and that's fine. But I think Shout the majority Bella. of folks... What's that? Oh, I, I see him chatting, and he's like, I like crafting, and I'm like... I'm <laughs> <laughs> I, like I like your, your solution of, you know, like the obtaining the items through quests, et cetera, and having somebody that can do that work for you works really yeah. well. Um, but then it also just feels like I don't know, it gets turned into a shopping list. And I know some people, like some players come into a game and have like, they really want to get this specific thing. But for me, that's an opportunity to take that and make that like a, a, a quest item or, you know, something that ties in more with their narrative background. The only times I really get into crafting and, and we'll kind of go down that route is when, you know, something happens in game, they find, uh, you know, a, a beast or whatever, something that I wasn't thinking of as part of an item, right? And they come up with that. And all of a sudden they get like this spark of excitement about like, oh my God, like I want to turn this, you know, this grizzly bear hide into something awesome. And I'm like, well, that's pretty dope. Um, and I started thinking about how I can work it in. But generally, I if somebody was like, I want to craft this, I'd be like, wow, you go to the store to buy supplies and it's on sale for this amount of things. And this guy will give it to you if you complete this quest. Like I don't... I don't want to deal with it. So anybody out there who likes crafting, don't play in my games. It's okay. Also, bless your heart. Sorry. Um, I got, okay. You guys can't see it, but I just got a look from our producer that you would not believe. Um, yeah. She's uh, giving us all sorts of faces about how uh, I think she's mimicking that she like loves crafting. And if I could read her lips right... And- She's about three seconds away from pulling on a whiteboard and being yeah. like, promote crafting or something. On it. I don't know, maybe. Um, oh, I'm getting a note now. Um, and I'd just like to thank our sponsor, Crafts R Us, for yeah. everything that they're doing for us. Um, if you're not crafting, you're not having fun. Um, yep, thanks. Uh, back to you, Brett. Uh, get 20% off with uh, the, the keyword at Geek Attack uh, <laughs> for your crafting needs. Yep, yep. Um, yeah, I, I think it, it takes too long. I think that it's like you you I have enough I I don't like grocery shopping in real life. Why do I need to do grocery shopping in game to get an item I want? Like the only reason I think I'd want to do crafting is like I want I want this item. Okay, you can't have it. Like it's it's not on sale. Okay, I guess I, I, I make it then. Like so how often do you find yourself in game coming up like wanting that item that you know, like it just comes to you? Is it something you bring into the game with you as a player as opposed to a character? Or is it something that like results from actions that occur in the game? 50-50, I guess. I, some, sometimes I feel like I, I need... Uh, there would be a magic item that would like round out this character better because like I want a character that like throws daggers, but I don't want to like be bothered with by like counting how many throwing daggers I have left in my inventory. So I'm like, mm-hmm. there, there's that magic item of like wrist, whatever of throwing daggers. And it's like, oh, you can throw throwing daggers, whatever. And it infinite regenerates. I'm like, great. Just, I don't give it to me. <laughs> like, I don't care. Right. But I, I, I get it. I think for me, that's like, have that conversation with your DM and we'll make that part of the game. Yeah. Um, I have a, a character in, in one of my games that is, uh, he's like following the Storm Lord in, in the homebrew world. 
And um, he really wanted to have like, lo like a lore around like someone who previously followed her um, generations ago. Um, and, you know, an artifact that they received from her as bounty because they were such a loyal follower and he wanted to find it. So I took that and I broke it into three parts. Um, and each of them has, you know, effects on their own, but you only get the truly effect like when you have all three of them together. And like, if you have two of them, you'll get even, you know, a little bit of bonus, but all three of them have a bigger bonus. So he's getting magic items as part of quest, but he's like sort of also crafting by, by bringing them together. Mm -hmm. um, and it sort of fulfills it's a little bit of that. Crafting. Yeah, exactly. I very, very much the air quotes around it because if you had to be like, well, now I find mithril ingots, I'd be like, well, now you find yourself a new DM. <laughs> so, and, and I get it because like it, it's it's weird how it, it it's okay if you need to do this quest to like find these like MacGuffins and then shove all the MacGuffins together in like a Voltron form and hey, you did the thing. But if it's right. like I need to like get the shopping thing of like I need mithril ignits now I need to go to the mithril mine I need to mine it to smelt it and do those things and like have the dwarf bless it and it's like I, I don't have time for this yeah and it because you look you're you want to have fun too um you're yeah. the, the dm's totally allowed to have fun I want to write that down that's really important um how do you how do you tackle um like non-magical items what if like the the players want a fortress in an area that's like you know there's not a fortress not like conquering a fortress and taking it over right they found like a, a mountain glade and they want to build a stronghold there how do you how do you tackle something like that well um i've i don't know if you know about matt Koval and his like stronghold and followers book but i um, did not know about the book no tell me more okay well uh do you know about matt Koval? i do he okay he for those who don't know he is a youtuber who basically does what we do but uh has more of a following uh, where he, just he does what says, we do better. Yeah, where he, he, he says things about his thoughts about D&D, &D, and also he wrote a 5th edition uh, Dungeons & Dragons book thing where it's called Strongholds and Followers, and it details how one could build strongholds and followers. So... Um, when building your followers, it's, very, it's important I, to get enough electricity to properly reanimate them. Otherwise, you'll find that parts of them will kind of herky jerk and not, you know, move the way you want. So remember, kids, when building followers, lightning storms. Sorry, Brett, go ahead. No, and so I guess I would just be like, listen, I've been dying to use this book, so I'm so glad you want to build a fortress. Here, here's here's what's going to happen, and then I'd kind of lay that out. But uh, I think it stems from the like non-magical things. Uh, Okay, so I guess in fifth edition, I, I think we both know that like gold is kind of useless. Like, like there there isn't like what do you buy with like ten thousand gold? You do you talk to your demon and be like, I want to buy a fortress, and he's like, I guess so. And do you ever play uh, what was it, uh, Cookie Clicker? Yes. Okay, so gold in D and D is like Cookie Clicker. Yeah. You start off and you have like nothing and you're like, I got yeah. a couple gold pieces and now I can like stay at an inn. And then like five sessions later, you're like, I need 500 gold pieces so I can stay at this nicer inn. Like it just, everything scales because nobody, the economy in D&D &D is like one of the most broken things, right? Because like it just, yeah. the DM just throws, you know, like money into the economy. It's like inflation should really be through the roof if people yeah. weren't dying left and right. Um, and it's, so it's broken. We all know it's broken. So we actually act like money doesn't have meaning in D&D &D and we just move on. Um, so yeah, I, I completely agree with you. You can't base real material benefits off of just like random amounts of gold, right? Like that's why when we say like, okay, you have to get this item, it costs this amount of money. What we're really saying is in our mind, we know of a quest that will reward you the amount of money that gets you the item you have in mind, right? Like you're just, just sort of making a middleman with, with the gold. Yeah. Um, Sk skip the middle part. Just tell me how to get to the end point. Exactly. But that you can tie that back to the you know the allies, right? Like you want that 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 mountain fortress, cool. Well, you have to befriend the like the dwarving mining clan or something uh, to to make that happen. Um, so I think all, obviously yeah. a lot of these things tie in. It's the, the nature of, of DMing. But um, yeah, I agree with you. It's it's a hard thing. I'm gonna have to check out that book because it sounds like um, it sounds like Matt Colville has uh, tackled some hard questions. Oh oh, he has. Um, ha you've played 3.5 or Pathfinder, right? I, I feel yep. like you have. Okay, mm -hmm. so. Uh, for those who haven't played those, uh, back in those editions, they explicitly tied your character level to how much money they think you should have. And so a lot of people just kind of like hand waved away, um, like buying a lot of things, because since you assume that you have that much money 
and everything had an explicit price in the, in the Dungeon Master Guide, you, they would just be like, they cost this much. There you go. So I, for a long time, I was like, I think it was a good idea. Like, wow, like how innovative, like magic items don't have price. It's up to you. And now I'm kind of like, gold doesn't have, like gold doesn't mean anything anymore. I, I kind of want that back now. I, I feel like, like splitting it down the middle of like, you're allowed when making your character. And I think we've been doing this with the one shots where like you're level nine and also you get three uncommon magic items. I, I feel like walking into a campaign with that is okay. But like as soon as the campaign gets going, it's like, no, nah, you got you gotta you gotta work for it a bit. Yeah, I I agree with that. Although well, you gotta you know, start disagreeing. Well, it's not really disagreement as I as I know this isn't necessarily like on the on the docket for this evening, but um do you ever just like make a mistake and just give yep. a magic item out that you shouldn't have and the person gets like super attached? How do you deal with that? Like how do you take that back or nerf it or whatever in a way that doesn't make your players get real angry. Okay, so uh, I don't know if Jordan knows the story, but um, I took over, uh, she, she, I took her over uh, her campaign time slot uh, way back when, this was like last year, and uh, I was running through uh, Dragon Heist, I think it's called that, Dragon Heist? Um, where I how you were about to drop like an like a yet to be released sequel, and I was like, "Dragon yeah. Heist: The Perils of Infamy Beneath the Sewers and the How." I was gonna like get ready to like start wow. as we spoke. You heard here first, Dragon Heist. No, but <laughs> um, it, I guess like not really spoilers for the campaign. But at the end of the campaign, you get like fifty thousand gold, and so I was like, "Oh no!" Now the players are going on a shopping spree, and one of the players is like, "I want to buy a Boots of Haste," and I'm like, "Okay, well, I mean." That's not that bad. You, you move faster. I'm like, no, no, no. I want the, the boots of haste from Critical Role, where he like he gets the haste thing. And I'm like, okay, I, I guess. And so I'm like, I Google like, is this broken? And because I Google everything, um, and they're like, yeah, it's probably okay. And so I gave it to him, and he was a um, what's Gloomstalker Ranger. Um, so he would like at, like every encounter began with him like clicking his heels and then firing off like four attacks and he was like sharpshooting them all he had a magic bow and he had magic arrows because apparently that stacks now so he would just like annihilate half the encounter like the second the encounter began and i'm like okay so i need to talk to you now like the the boots aren't working man like do you like we have to retcon it like do you want to refund Do you want to rebuy it and he's like i just give me the money back and i'm like okay and they were mad, but you got to rip the bandit off. Like, there, there's no easy way to do it. Like, I, I would loathe anyone, like any DM who, like, in the middle of the night, bandits steal your prize magic item. It's like, well, I go kill them. Like, I want it back. Like, yeah. just... I so uh, Bella uh, mentioned in, in chat, like, he was saying just scale up you know, the encounter after that. And I, I get it, but I, two things. I, I find it hard if now you've accidentally um, imbalanced your party, which is which is a little yeah. awkward. Um, but otherwise, I think it can work. You know, sometimes you have players that don't realize, like basically you've just scaled the party and, and inherently nerf what they're doing. And it, it can be it can be a useful thing. But, you know, the, I think for that player, they want like a, at least a little bit of time to like just lay waste with that thing and, and kind of get the benefits of like, you know, maybe tricking the DM into giving it or, you know, making a savvy deal. Um, so I, I, I don't know. For me, it's always like, okay, like you, you, good job. You get like a few sessions of this, and then I'm gonna find a way to, to take it back. I, I did a thing once in a in a game where I basically had this like magical item trader, um, where it basically became like, sure, like you can swap back these things in, and I just, I basically loaded the person up with items that I knew would be very attractive for like an upcoming arc. But ultimately, they weren't going to be like as good as the items they had. So mm-hmm. many of them were like, "Oh yeah, like let me give up this thing and get that thing." And then they were like, "Oh man, I never should have given up that thing." And I was like, "That's the price you pay." Um, but yeah, it's tough because you don't want to be that DM who, you know, giveth and then taketh away. Yeah, it, it's even worse because uh, in in that party, uh, the cleric was a newer player, and she didn't. She kind of she knew how to play, and but like there there is an element of like. You kind of have to like vulture on a couple of things together to like do lots of damage or like be very effective. And so she like had like a long sword, but her strength wasn't very good. And like she had like a, 
a good amount of wisdom. She's a cleric, but like, you know, so she's like healed and swung her longsword and missed. And it's like, and then there's this guy over here with his boots of haste, like rapid fire machine gunning, all these things. Yeah. And I'm like, this just made it worse. Yeah. Um, Monk brings up a good point in chat, which is effectively like, you know, as long as you have a good line of communication with your players, uh, you've got good trust. Uh, this isn't going to be an issue because you can talk it out and, and bring it up. So absolutely. Uh, good point, Monk. I think anytime that you get into a situation where the game, you know, inadvertently breaks a little bit, it's a time for conversation with your players. You got to have that trust. You got to really have that, that good rapport um, to do it, which is why we get into so many issues on Tuesday's Geek Attack game. Because um, quite frankly, Brett and I, it's just oil and water. And um, yeah, I mean, there really isn't a better way to describe it than just completely unadulterated hatred for one another. Um, but on that note, um, why don't we get back to the presentation? Sure. Um, slide eight. Uh, I, I wanted to kind of go over how to design magic items. Uh, I feel like maybe we could talk it out about, about maybe our, our insights, if you will. Um, generally, I find like just straight numerical bonuses to be boring and would rather have magic items like just give you more options instead of more numbers and more power. Uh, and I think kind of the design of 5e in general leans into that. Um, a lot of feats don't give numerical bonuses either, which is why I feel like it leans, in, leans into that in opposition to older editions like 3.5 or 4e or Pathfinder. Right. So uh, slide nine. Let's start off with an example. Looking at these two items, which would you rather have? Um, and Smitty, I don't know if you're following along. It's one of these items basically allows you to dual wield uh, two-handed weapons, or the reverse of that is um, increases the damage you deal with all atta weapon attacks by two. Narratively, someone like me wants to go for the, the the dual wielding gloves of titanic grip there right but like i know that i'm probably nerfing my character's ability to do damage if i'm in a party of people there's like three people who go for you know the plus two bonus type things well would you be surprised if i said they're nearly numerically equivalent well i would wow be. okay um the reason is because i the what i thought in my head is if you're dual wielding in this way um, you're probably using long swords, and then you'd upgrade to great swords. And the damage difference from that, from upgrading from long swords to great swords, is an increase of about 2.5 damage per turn. Well, you've done the math, folks. And you know, if there's one thing we know, math doesn't lie. Yeah. Brett might, but math doesn't. No. So, having said that, given the two, the given the choice between the two, I think I'd choose just being able to do wield two handed weapons more. Yeah, I mean, well, it I just mean, it's cooler. It's cooler and you get a better bonus. But I don't think that's all there is to it. I mean, sometimes I want the narrative, the narrative display because here's what, it's the same thing we talked about. It's, it's scaling up, right? Like, great, you get your plus two bonus on your weapon. Um, and then you're like, oh, it's awesome, I hit more. And then like two games later, you don't care. Like you're just hitting more and it's like, whatever. But if every time I'm using the special quality of my weapon, it's like a cinematic thing where like, ice shoots out or like you know oh my god this like this mud monster wasn't expecting my like you know weird mud dust of dryness thing i don't know whatever like something that you can use your weapon for that makes an awesome cinematic um experience like give me that every day of the week yeah and that's well, not I, mean, well, I know there's there's min maxers there's crunchy folk out there and that's totally fine that's 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 a you know valid way they're all valid ways to play the game um but for me i'm i'm just never going to be going to be one of those people that just you know, wants to upscale my weapons. I, I want versatility. I want, I want exactly drama and story. Clearly, clearly I like uh, Fury Warriors from World of Warcraft where their whole thing is like, you get two big weapons and you just go crazy. I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, sign me up. Yeah. Um, so Jordan, slide 10. So what's an example of a bad magic item? This example will shock you. The bag of holding, prepare for your hot takes. I think this is a bad item design because its existence makes you need to care about weight limits. If it didn't exist, you could kind of like hand wave away how much your character is holding because you could actually carry 15 times your strength score. So even the average character, uh, so even an average strength character with 10 strength can hold 150 pounds worth of gear, which is actually more than enough for most circumstances. Not to mention, the volume limit on the bag of holding is actually mostly useless, considering you'll hit the weight limit first with most materials. The only thing I found that had a low enough density was styrofoam, and I don't think you're running into that a lot in Dungeons & Dragons. 
Additionally, most people don't want to have to worry about how much volume something takes up. Do you know off the top of your head uh, the volume for an amount of iron or wood or bread? No. In summation, I, uh, a magic item giving you the ability to break a rule isn't always useful, I think, feel like. <sighs> okay. I, I, I think that the, the what I don't like about what you just said is um, I think it ignores the narrative impacts of the bag of holding. I don't care. Nobody cares about weight limits. We don't care about that. We don't care about volume. Totally. Like the first thing I do when, um, when I'm creating a character on, you know, D&D Beyond is I click off the, you know, use encumbrance. Um, yeah. And I, and I move forward with my life because again, nobody wants to do that in a game. Um, I, however, but the whole point of the bag of holding is like, nobody knows you got this thing. Like, yeah, sure. We could all be like, you know, the, the one man band that has like a billion things attached to themselves and everyone would be like, yeah, you're carrying the same amount, but like, it's way cooler to just have it all in, in your little thing. And I know the volume is exactly the same, but you get what I'm saying. Like, it's cooler just to be like, well, let me pull a giant thing out of the bag um, in a way that impacts, you know, the, the story uh, in just a more fun way. So I don't, I don't, again, I don't think, I think your argument's flawed because it relies on the math as opposed to the fun. Okay. Um, well, consider this. Would you rather, instead of uh, whatever the bag of holding says, uh, it just says, you ignore material, like you ignore weight limits. You have to bound it. Okay. Because then How I'm carrying like an entire village. No, I'm saying you're, you would have to bound what you're saying, your rule, because okay. I'm carrying like an entire village on my back. Hey, everyone, we're going to Brindle and it's okay. I've got you. And now I just carry all the bell to the, the castle. Well, you can't because it doesn't have any air in it still. I forgot to mention that part. <laughs> I, uh, no, I think you, cause you, then you're just, it's just a, a bottomless pit that you're carrying around with you. I, I, maybe it's, it's, it's sort of the ability to like, just summon it, summon it out of thin air. And maybe you get like a number of things that you can do it with, as opposed to a weight limit or a volume limit. It's just like, you can store 10 items extra plainly um, and summon them at will. Yeah. I, yeah. Giving it a, an item limit instead of a weight limit, I think is a lot better. But I guess people are going to be like, well, I have these 10 bags and I'm going to put these 10 bags in the bag of holding. It's like, no, no, come on. I, Yeah, I, again, like I just, I, I, I think there's other ways to get around it, but I, it, I don't bother with it because I think it's it's just all narrative. Um, you know, Chad's are, uh, in chat says, bag of holding doesn't change that, just modern players don't want to track that sort of thing for their art. For the RP fanfic writing using D&D as a background, okay, that takes maybe a little bit harsher hit on the, <laughs> on the narrative elements of, of D&D. But yeah, I don't think I don't think a lot of people do want to track the the very crunchy uh, elements of, of games. And honestly, if they did, it probably wouldn't. It's one of the reasons it has exploded a lot more because because we got away from uh, some of that crunchy stuff um, that that probably was barrier to entry for folks. But I do think that uh, again, you know, what's in the service of the game player table? If you've got a bunch of people playing your game that really care about this stuff then yeah then maybe it is a terrible item because you know fo folks are focused they want to have a, like a gritty realism to their game they only want to carry so many things right but if you have a group of people that like wants to pull pies out of thin air because they have fun having like you know celestial picnics or something cool like give them a bag of holding and let fun range throw out the picnics whenever you want yeah of course yeah um well i guess moving on uh i thought i'd try to um design a magic item for um, Smitty's character, War Pastor Zachariah. Uh, on slide 11, here's an example of an item I'd make. Um, an easy formula I try to follow is that I have like one passive benefit, like it's a plus one weapon, one active benefit that works in combat, and another one that works out of combat. So for, for those of you who don't know, War Pastor Zachariah is a half-orc cleric who preaches his beliefs to bolster the spirits of his comrades along with fortifying their body with pumpernickel bread. I, I made this magic item to sort of like reflect how I envisioned Zachariah in, uh, interacting with the world and what he'd do to help in combat. Thoughts, Smitty? The wall past the Zachariah feels very strongly about interacting through the world with his war hammer because nothing says faith, glory, and preaching all that is held dearly, like slamming one's hammer into the face of those who would oppose the might and the justice of the Aegis Destrano. 
Well, so, yeah. I'm glad I made it a mall. Yeah, yeah, it's important. Um, I I like it. Um, you know, I like that you have the the passive elements uh, that can come into play. You know, outside of of combat, um, it's it makes it a nice. It, it makes it a nice kind of overlap between um, you know different elements of the game. You connect the the RP portions with the combat portions a little bit more. The the item becomes more personal to to Zachariah. Um, do you give it a quality like you can do one of these things like a couple times a day? So if you blow it, if you blow Zone of Truth in a uh, RP setting, you may not have uh the weapon function later in the day or vice versa oh so you kind of like overload it and burn it out yeah i mean Ooh, again okay. I, I choice with consequences is, is the kind of thing that i love i i i i okay i'll be truthful initially i'd be like this magic item is broken like, i could only choose one but i think after like you're forced to 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 be creative and weigh the whole I need this now versus the I need this later, and so it gets you thinking more creative about the situations where you can't just be like, "Well, I guess I'm using Zone of Truth because, like, why not? I have it. It's free. Right. Like, I'll, I'll use it." So, I, I I like that idea. I like how like if you use this item, you burn it out with the other thing. That's a good idea. I'm, I'm thank you for agreeing I'm, with me, Brad. Yeah, I I can't be the devil's advocate, but sometimes you just have to agree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, our producer is staring at us like i think this this might be bad copy brett i don't know but we're, we're getting the look like you know this this may be this may be bad media here should we no 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 again she's waving I'm us giving, off she's waving us off i'm giving a word from my uh, producer that she's she's totally cool with with us saying all that so yeah okay. it's it's totally okay um well, i guess we agreed that was that was the point of it yeah yeah, yeah. Um, I guess uh, on, I want to talk a bit about the rate of acquisition for magic items because I, f I feel like uh, on slide 12. Before, um, before you talk about the rate of acquisition, Brett, I want to talk about the rate of this panel. We've got okay. five minutes left, so just keep that in mind. Okay, I, I'll try to speed through it. Um, here's a chart from Xanathar's Guide to Everything showing what they think is the average amount of magical swag your average party should have at given levels. As you can see, it's quite a bit, especially at higher levels. Unfortunately, according to D&D Beyond, 90% of characters are between levels 1 and 10. Unfortunately, this means you'll miss out on a bunch of items, and most of those items that you do get will probably be consumable. See why I thought they were important before? I think new DMs in general are worried about over-rewarding players with stuff, but with a 2 minute they can be really only use three items at a time. Any magic item that isn't just a straight plus requires a two in, so that's one down right there. Magic items or magic armor is the same. So while I wouldn't be surprised if there were some people out there that could vulture on three magic items into a deadly combo, the opposite is far more common, where three items is a perfectly fine max. What should you take away from this rant? That you should probably take some take some of my advice and start throwing around more stuff. <laughs> I feel like um, Brett must have played a lot of games when he was younger where the DMs were very stingy with magic items, and this is all just a way know. for him to, to work through those emotions, which yeah. is good, folks. Talking about your feelings is a good thing. Um, on slide 13, uh, I took an anecdotal poll where I asked how many magic items your character has, and these are the results. The th thing I kind of took away from this is that it seems like most people either get zero magic items, zero one magic items, or more than five apparently, which I thought was interesting. And I'm not just saying this just so people are like, oh, give me more magic items, but I thought it's interesting to see how other people play D&D, how some people kind of go the low magic route, uh, like our producer. I mean, what? Um, and some people go the high magic route, like me. I think it's fair. I think I think what it speaks to is also, um, honestly, there's probably an element of uh, economics in this. Um, if you think about it, uh, if you are if you are magic item poor, you don't have the capital to get more magic items. Mm. But once you start to get magic items, the rate of acquisition for your magic items, you know, uh, speeds up. Uh, you you got to have money to make money. 
Um, and if you never get to that point, uh, you're just never gonna you're never gonna start moving faster. Now, obviously, as as DMs, we can we can impact that, but um, I bet your characters are more brazen and willing to go after uh, hard to find magic items if they're already packing some magic items. So I think that once you cross that barrier and you have a kind of a critical amount of magic, you're just going to start like amassing a boatload of, of magic items. Yeah. And I feel like that's kind of okay because you can only bear, like bring to bear so many magic items at one time. Like I know some items don't require attunement, but like, even with that, it's not like you're going to walk around with like, 15 slingshots of super kill and you kind of fire them all off at one time and like destroy everything on the way you haven't played with some players that i've played with yeah. uh, but I, it's i it's more for me i find like the person who has like a slingshot of super kill and a slingshot of like super slime and a slingshot of like super decks and like you know like they want they want something for every possibility because you know god forbid they had to like get into a situation and you know not succeed um which maybe in a future point uh, we'll get into one of my favorite panel topics, which is failure is fun, but uh, that's for uh, another day. Well, speaking of another day uh, on slide 14, um, my initial example of getting maybe a couple silver from a battle with some bandits isn't some inherent failing. Sometimes you just, just can't uh, justify rewards from every tiny skirmish, and that's fine. Hopefully this sort of encounter is a rarity in your game and hopefully even rarer after listening to us jabber for on for however long. Again, I'm Brett. This is Smitty. Catch us Tuesdays at 9.30 EST on this channel for Geek Attack and follow us at Geek Attack. Smitty, do you have some final thoughts? Uh, first and foremost, I will be on the next game to air, uh, reprising the role of the wall past Zachariah um, with our uh, lovely producer and soon-to-be DM, Jordan, uh, taking the reins in that game. Um, no, I think you, uh, uh, you taught us a lot tonight, Brett, and I, I really appreciate the, uh, the time you put into uh, to, to, uh, I think you taught us, us a lot, too. Wow, it's almost like it's a it's a happy go fun uh, fun family festival right now in Grammar Jamboree. Yeah, yeah. we're all having a fun jamboree. Um, does our producer have any final thoughts before we uh, sign off? Or cue cards, whiteboard, any yeah. facial features you want to make that no one else can see but us? I'm getting a message from my producer to again shout out uh, Jasper Game Week uh, from May 3rd to May 7th. You, they definitely are the best thing that's going on then so definitely check them out also uh through the discord into the channel for those of you who are not already part of the thread writers community please join up and say hello continue chatting disagreeing whatever you may want with brett uh don't at me but at brett with all of your thoughts uh and where he is wrong i think it will be a very uh, enlightening conversation for both you and him all right uh thanks you too uh for being on my panel. Uh, Jordan is our producer and Smitty, again, is my lovely panelist. Um, and I guess that's it. So hit, 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 hit the button and, and we're done. <laughs>